we're going to go back to Katub and we're going to learn uh, for ourselves if we think video games are art or not, I think. Or maybe we don't have a choice. We'll find out. I will present what I have to present and you guys can make your decisions. All right, can everyone see my screen? Um, vaguely nod. Okay, I see some vague nods. Um, hey everyone, so my, oop, let me start my little timer so I don't go over time. Um, hey everyone, my name is Katab Gandhi. Uh, I am a PhD student studying games and philosophy, and I, um, I personally believe that games can be art. Um, and I'm here to uh, maybe convince you of that fact. So games are a relatively new medium. Uh, here I'm talking about video games specifically. Um, video games have been around for like 50-ish years, and they've only really gotten into their own in the last 20 or even 10 years. Uh, compare that to like paintings and stuff, which have been around for hundreds of years. So before we start to talk about like how games can be art and like whether they deserve the same respect and stuff, uh, let's talk about what art is, first of all. Um, so this image, probably art it's well painted it's interesting it took a lot of skill you know it's formal i guess um you know it's it's a painting that a lot of people would consider art uh how about this one uh this one is a bit more controversial while i'm not saying anything myself or my own opinions uh, a lot of people say that like oh it looks childish it looks like you know a beginner could draw this and you know this and that and what about something like this it's squares it what what is it what is it doing it is squares um and so while again i'm not saying whether i believe this is art or not a lot of people look at this and say oh you know there's no skill involved it doesn't evoke the same emotions it's not as formal um but there are people who do believe that these kinds of things are art um so this kind of debate um, is a very, very long and complex one. I am using one slide on it, but there are literally books written about this topic. So the dictionary definition of art is, who cares, stop using a dictionary to sound smart. And jokes aside, I do kind of want to step away from this extremely formal idea of we have to define this is art, this isn't. Um, I think that when we talk about what art is, we're really kind of saying, oh, this is interesting, it evokes emotions in me, I think that it was like well made, et cetera, et cetera. And if we look at art in that way, I think we can have a more interesting conversation, even if it isn't as philosophically formal as I would like to be. So different media, we talk about different media being artistic in different ways. For example, with paintings, we talk about maybe the skill and the visual effects and, you know, whether it's well done, you know. Um, but with movies, we kind of talk differently. We talk about their plots and we talk about their cinematography. And to be clear, we still talk about movies as like beautiful pieces. But if a movie was just beautiful in the same way that a painting was, people wouldn't call that a good movie. They'd say, oh, that's a neat slideshow of interesting visual things. And then with books, it's even less, you know, there's no visuals at all, assuming you're talking about a novel. It's all about the wordplay and how the authors use that. And so this kind of leads to the question, you know, if paintings are artistic based on visuals, roughly speaking, movies based on cinematography, roughly speaking, and books on wordplay, um, then how do we talk about games in an artistic sense? What, what's artistic about games and what have you? So as the title of this slide kind of gives away, the neat part about games is that they're interactive. And so when we think about games as art, um, I really want to talk about games that use their interactivity in interesting ways that, that, that push that kind of boundary. And I want to be clear that there are a lot of visually stunning games out there that deserve a lot of respect and have a lot of skill that went into them. Um, and I don't want to say that these are like less than or whatever. It's just that if a game was only visually stunning, we would say, oh, that's a pretty 3D game, but it isn't really like an artistic game or it doesn't, you know, push the bounds of interactivity like games can. 
<clears throat> so the first way in which games can use their interactivity in an artistic fashion and push the boundaries and such is the, um, the a game's ability to provide perspective taking, which is when you put yourself in the shoes of the main character. This is a common staple of books and movies as well, but games can push it a little bit further by being, um, you know, through the fact that you are controlling the main character, you are literally in their shoes, or, well, that was still a metaphor, so I apologize for that, <laughs> a little more literally in their shoes. And a game that I'd like to bring up as an example is Gris. Um, Gris is a game about trauma and grief. Uh, in the beginning, the main character suffers some trauma. It's kind of unclear what it is, but I think that was meant to be intentionally vague so you can uh, put your own ideas onto it. The main character suffers some sort of trauma and as you go through the game, you mend with her you um you bring yourself whole you make yourself happy and you feel her traumas just as you feel how you've grown with her and i think that's something that you couldn't do in a movie just because you um, are controlling the main character and you're playing along with her unfortunately it's kind of hard to explain considering that this is still just still images if you really want the experience you're gonna have to go play gris oh no the second way that games can really use this idea of interaction is interacting with your beliefs. Um, I imagine that everyone on this call believes to some extent that they are moral upstanding citizens. The game Papers, Please um, is a game where you are a Soviet era border patrol guard and you are trying to ensure that only the right people get into the country. Well, the game starts off pretty simply, but then it starts to throw more and more challenges at you. Do you let someone in who doesn't have a passport but is being you know, persecuted in their home country? Do you let someone in when they just want to be reunited with their husband, despite the fact that they have a minor typo on their entrance papers? And all of that is happening to the backdrop of the pressure back home where your family is starving and you have to do this job correctly in order to put food on the table. Um, and so in this way, the game takes your belief of, you know, I'm an upstanding person, I would do the right things and challenges you harder and harder and makes you reflect on that fact. Another game that's even more intense is The Stanley Parable. Uh, in it, you play as this character, Stanley, who is a boring, humdrum office worker. Um, and, um, you know, the game sets up Stanley as this boring character. Stanley has no um, control over his life. He just does what other people tell him to. And in the end, he's a character controlled by you. But then the game kind of flips that on its head and points out, hey, aren't you like Stanley? Don't you have no control over your life? Don't, aren't you forced to do what other people tell you? And in this way, it breaks down the notions of free will that a lot of us have. Um, and it can only do that by the fact that you are playing it. Um, I have a bit more to say, but unfortunately it gets into spoiler territory and, and this and that. All right, all right. I'm sure we all have our opinions on what our favorite games as art are. Mine's Portal 2, don't try to argue with me. Uh, but now we're going to go into something a little bit different. I'm going to talk about uh, sleeping, uh, like I said, or at least what I do while people are sleeping, uh, which is watch them. Can everybody see what I am looking at? All right, I'm going to take that as a yes. So I work as a sleep tech uh, and my Zoom stuff is all over the place for some reason. Cool. So I work as a sleep tech and I watch people sleep all night and I get paid to do it. And so I'm going to share with you what I have learned about polysomnography, uh, also known as sleep studies. So welcome to my job. This is a picture of my lab and my boss on a night where we had to string wires across the entire lab. As you can see, there's a ton of equipment, there's data, uh, and many, many wires and tubes. And on the right are some of those wires and tubes once we hook it up to somebody and try to get them to get a normal night's sleep so that we can appraise it and evaluate it to see if there's any disturbances happening, even if it's not the best night of sleep. 
So here's some old photos, blast from the past. This was uh, when I was 13, I got a sleep study done. And so I've annotated it a little bit. On the left, you can see the sleep tech that hooked me up to all the equipment. And uh, some things I wanna point out, you can see that on my finger, I'm wearing an oxygen probe that measures how much oxygen is in my blood. Uh, I might refer to that as SAO2 or oxygen saturation. You can see that I'm, my head is wrapped up like I'm a mummy. Now, I don't usually do that, and most people don't usually do that, but for some reason they decided to. Underneath all of these bandages are EEGs, and these are used not only during sleep studies, but also to see if somebody has epilepsy or is having seizures and other things like that. But in sleep studies, it's important because that's what tells us if somebody is asleep, measuring their brain waves quite literally. It also can tell us what stage of sleep the person is in, which is important. You can also see I have this little tube kind of sticking in my nostrils. That's called a nasal cannula, and usually that's providing oxygen to somebody. Uh, but in this case, it's not actually providing any oxygen to me. It's measuring the pressure of what comes out of my nose. And then you can also see that I have these taped things on my chin. Those are chin EMGs. Uh, they measure if any weird chin stuff is happening. The M stands for muscular. And then you can also see I have this belt right here. That's a respiratory belt. There's one across my chest and one across my abdomen. And they measure the rise and fall of my chest and also what body position I'm in while I'm sleeping. So to look at this data as it comes through, this is what I see all night. And uh, when I die, I know that this data is just gonna be wiggling by my eyes uh, as, as I go to the pearly gates. But sometimes I get to do fun things with it on this particular day, it was during Pride Month, so I decided to go rainbow. Uh, as you can see here, we have a different, a number of different streams coming through. So I've broken them down by what they are. So you can see that at the top, we have a bunch of stuff that's basically just measuring if someone is snoring or not and how loud they're snoring. So every time, uh, I will see if I can annotate a little bit. Every time you see one of these, that's someone snoring. And then in the middle, you can see oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange. So what you can tell is that these are opposite one another. And that's because when one's coming out, the other's going in, or you get the point. Here's where you can see that blood oxygen saturation. And normally 90 or above is really good. And so that's what we want to see. Uh, and usually that's just going to be basically a flat line all night if it's a healthy patient. And at the bottom, that's that pressure of the airflow coming out here. You can see that my patient is supine. That means they're on their back. I'm really bad at drawing arrows. And then here you can see those that activity from that chest and abdomen band. That's that rise and fall of the chest. These are important. These are eye movement, ROC and LOC is what we call them. They're EOGs, the O stands for ocular, just like all of these other E blank G words. And that can help tell us whether a patient is in REM sleep or not. And what's actually pretty cool is those signals are kind of opposite too. If I look that way or this way, <laughs> if I can do that right, uh, they'll be opposite each other, just like the gases on the left side. The rest of these are all EEGs. And in a second, I'll get to what these letters right here stand for. And those tell us what stage of sleep the person is in or if they're even asleep at all. You can see right here, that's that chin EMG. Uh, usually it's hard to get very good data out of it. Most of our patients have like beards or stubble or something, and then that's really hard to tape stuff there. And then here uh, we're measuring heart rate. So that's basically just a simple two lead EKG and seeing uh, what's happening there. So a little bit about EEGs. Oh no, I need to make my annotations go away. There we go. No, no. Uh, undo. Oh, that'll help. Yep, we're gonna do it that way. Great. All right, so EEGs. So there's actually a standard international system for how EEGs are applied. It's made it impossible for me to watch Grey's Anatomy. And so these letters all stand for basically a different region of the brain. So the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the temporal lobe, the occipital lobe, and what site that's over. We take this stuff on the left, it's called 1020 gel, because this is the 1020 system. And it's basically like if Crisco and Vaseline had a baby and it smells really, really great in the morning after eight hours of uh, body odors seeping into it. And so we take that, we slather it on and we apply gauze and then we stick the electrodes to the scalp so you have to move the hair out of the way. On the right is Judy and she is my lab mascot because she is the training dummy for learning how to apply EEGs. There's a picture of me at work wearing Judy on my head. We use some other equipment. Um, so things that we use to measure respiration, airflow, gases. On the left, that's a full face mask. That's what people who have sleep apnea wear with their CPAP machines. 
We usually have this giant Darth Vader tube in the middle sticking out of it um, because that is how we measure the pressure in the mask. In the middle here, you can see that the little girl is wearing those belts like I talked about. She also has a probe on her finger for her blood oxygen and she's wearing a nasal cannula. That's a, an easier way of measuring the pressure of, of airflow. Some other things that we record, we have that microphone, we stick it right here to our patient's uh, chest and that's how we record how loud they're snoring, but believe me, I listen to it all night. Uh, usually labs have the sleep tech rate someone snoring. In the middle, that's a continuous blood pressure monitor. We use that sometimes, it gets blood pressure every five seconds or so. And on the right, sometimes labs will have videos recording, you know, recording the people sleeping. Um, we don't do that because our cameras were old and I have better things to do all night than actually watch anybody sleep. So it's kind of a misconception there. I also get to do fun things. Sometimes we take needles and inject wires into people's tongues, and then I get to pull them out in the morning. And sometimes we take a catheter, not that kind, an esophageal catheter, and we put it up someone's nose and down and back around. And I hope everyone's squirming in their chair and it goes down the esophagus right to the top of their stomach. And I get to pull that spaghetti thing out in the morning. So it's a lot of fun. Some other stuff we do in the morning, sometimes we'll do blood pressure or urinalysis. Uh, so it rounds out the big bodily fluids that we deal with. We also do blood pressures and vitals and often my patients, because I work with a population that all has sleep apnea for the most part, usually their blood pressure is really, really high in the morning, they're hypertensive. Uh, it's just something associated with the, the morbidity of sleep apnea. We also do some questionnaires on the right. You can maybe do this for yourself. This is the Epworth, Epworth sleepiness scale. And that's basically how likely are you to fall asleep while doing any of these tasks. And the bottom functional outcomes of sleep questionnaire uh, that concerns different domains of life, occupational, social, sexual, physical. And that's how much impairment do you have because of your lack of sleep. So those are some things we do. Now let's think back to that data that I showed you and let's see what we can gather from looking at these these waves from this patient. So what you can see I've identified here is there's this 20 second interval right here. And that 20 second interval is that patient not breathing. That's an apnea. And so what's happening here is you'll see that there's 20 seconds where the patient's not breathing and then they'll take a few gasps of air if we're looking at the bottom, then they're not breathing and over and over and over again. You can also see if you look in the, uh, I'm gonna call them the third and the fourth uh, lines that that oxygen and, and carbon dioxide, that, that flow kind of stops to a halt. And then most importantly, at the top, you can see their blood oxygen saturation, instead of being that flat line that it should be in someone who's healthy, it's going like this all night during all these periods where they're not breathing. And it actually drops as low as 80% in this patient. That means that's how much oxygen is in their blood. And I've had patients whose blood oxygen saturation does this all night, but it drops as low as 60 or 65%. If you showed up at the hospital and your blood oxygen saturation was 80%, they would be admitting you right away. But this is something that happens while people are asleep. Now we're gonna do kind of a case study. I showed you those pictures of 13 year old Lauren and now I'm gonna show you her polysomnographic study report. So only one thing that I've identified here is that they said I was sleeping in a comfy bed. Apparently that's taken as fact. You can see that some of those uh, electrode sites that we were talking about are in use, SAO2, EOGs, EMGs, this is all great stuff. But now let's look at some of the data. So some of the results from this study, uh, I've highlighted here, sleep latency was prolonged at two hours. It took me two hours to fall asleep. That's statistically important because we might not have gotten the greatest data from that night. But we also say that sleep architecture and efficiency was poor. Basically, I only slept 60% of the time that I was in bed. And then we look at respiratory events. And this is the bread and butter of what I do. I'll explain in a second. Basically, I only had two kind of really minor breathing events for the entire night where I, my, my blood oxygen saturation just kind of went down a little bit. So this is how we interpret our patient's data with regard to apnea hypopnea index. That's how many times an hour do you stop breathing? Mine was only 0.4, but I have patients at my work that are uh, in the 80s for their AHI. They stop breathing 80 times an hour every time, every hour throughout the whole night. And that's because I'm a research sleep technician. I don't just work with anybody who comes into the clinic. I work with a special study population. 
So I work with people with sleep apnea or who think that they have it. I work with people who snore because we're trying out some of our sleep apnea treatments with them. I work with, uh, or I have worked with patients with acromegaly. That's this guy in the middle on the top over here. Uh, it's a soft tissue disorder. I've also worked with people with chronic rhinosinusitis. That was fun. We actually administered them scratch and sniff tests. And I've also worked with a lot of people who are just professional lab rats. That's what they do for work and they qualify for our studies. Uh, in the bottom right, you can see my boss turning off all of our equipment just to see kind of what the, the, the kind of load is for what we need to perform one of these studies. So some treatments that we've done, a lot of what we do is drug stuff. So we've, we've given our patients many, many, many drugs uh, and some of them don't always work out so well. And then we've also worked with patients who have had devices surgically implanted in their chest that stimulate their airway to keep it open to prevent them from having these apneas or breathing events. Same as these retainer oral appliance type things, they help keep the airway open. But the most important part of my job, the most important part of watching someone sleep on the left, this is the Belmont report. This is the pinnacle of the privilege of working with people in a research setting. And so my job is to uphold that privilege that I have by always making sure that we are being the most respectful that we need to be of their agency and autonomy. And on the right, my second most important job at work, it's not to collect the data, it's to make sure that my patients feel safe and are comfortable and have the most sound night of sleep and rest that they possibly can. Mostly because if they don't, we don't get any data. And that is it for me. But now we're going to learn about something that Corey does, not quite for work, uh, but for fun. So I'm going to pivot over to Corey. Awesome. Thank you for that. Were those your ferrets or ferrets from the internet? They, they are not? Trevor's ferrets. Oh my god. I've never seen such a cute, well, I've never seen a sleeping ferret, period, but I didn't know they were so cute. They um, sleep 18 hours of the day. I've actually diagnosed one of our ferrets with sleep apnea. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so my firestorm talk is going to be my attempt to convince you that you should adopt this new hobby, which is called printmaking. And um, one of the things I'm going to also try to convince you is that printmaking can kind of be anything and everything. Um, so these are some fun like rubber stamp things that I've carved in the past. But to begin this talk, let's kind of start from the ground up, right? What is printmaking? And uh, I went to the, to the only source I could think of, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which defines printmaking as an artistic process based on the principle of transferring images from a matrix onto another surface, most often paper or fabric. So what might start to come to mind for you is maybe the printing press, um, there's those cool screen printing machines that are used on t-shirts. Um, maybe you got a stamp on your passport um, when you went on a trip somewhere. Um, or uh, what I th thought of is I have a, a little flower pot that looks just like this and it's a little imprint of a leaf. Um, and when I started to kind of wax about printmaking, I thought, what makes this um, you know, a little intentional print of a leaf so different than a fossil. It's kind of like the same thing, right? But just unintentionally nature like happened. And then many, many years later, we discovered this. Um, so why don't we call this art? And why do we call this art? Um, so I'm kind of going to skew the definition a little bit and include fossil making under this definition of printmaking. And I would say fossil making is pretty much the exact same thing, but perhaps it's just not an artistic process. Um, so now I'm going with this, there's printmaking and then there's fossil making. And my new definition of the two um, is describing printmaking as intentional, creative and artistic and fossil making as more coincidental, factual information based, just really capturing exactly what exists around you um, at a certain time. Um, but in, in one keyword, uh, I wanted you to try to spot the difference between these two pictures because they're really, I don't know, they're really similar. And I, it took me quite a while to really crack the code on this one, but I would say the main difference between this printmaking and fossil making, I don't know which is left, which is right, um, is intention. Um, spoiler, I'm saying the left is printmaking. Um, so I thought it was a really cool kind of comparison to say, 
um, your artistic printmaking is really just you intentionally capturing what's around you, either whether it's something in the natural world or something that you're creating and deciding to capture. Um, and you can continue capturing, right? Because you can make as many prints as you want. So um, I'd like to add to the definition that not only is printmaking what the Metropolitan Museum of Art says, but it's also intentionally preserving the natural or uniquely created world around oneself. And that is something you can do. So if you need another reason to get into print printmaking, um, I'm going to give you one. And that is that I personally guarantee that right after this talk, actually right after Firestorm, because you should stick around for the other talks, you can start making printing uh, or prints, sorry, with whatever supplies you have around you at home. So I've made this scale of difficulty and um, what I want our kind of inspiration slash theme to be are tree prints. Um, so the scale goes from the left side of the screen, something you can make with really few supplies, little to no money and is very easy. And then on the right of the screen is something where many supplies are required, many tools might require a bit of money invested and can be quite challenging. So I actually have a ton of props around me and we're going to make each of these prints right now, just in case you needed a little tutorial. So my first print is going to be um, Play-Doh. I have some Play-Doh, don't ask why I have it. I also sacrificed a little leaf from one of my house plants. I'm going to press this leaf into my Play-Doh and you know, you can do this with whatever clay medium or squishy medium you have at home. Not sure what another squishy medium would be, maybe like a soft cheese. Um, and voila, it's very hard to capture on my very bright, bright light, but there's my tree print. And don't worry, I didn't disappoint. I also have a potato, but I already sliced it in half and I already drew a little tree on it. And with a little bit of movie magic, I actually already cut it with a knife into the shape of a tree. And what do you know, I also have a little stamp pad here. So I haven't tried this before, but I'm going to, okay, yeah, press my potato into my stamp pad and it's getting green. I have a piece of paper. I'm gonna press my potato stamp and it's a little faint, but I mean, not bad. Um, my other stamp is luckily at one that I've already made out of an eraser. And um, if you have like, you need quite a sharp knife for this, but I have a set of X-Acto knives and some carving tools. Um, you can carve an eraser like this into a little tree like this. So it's kind of hard to see, but you have like some negative and positive space, like some stuff sticking outward, some, st some stuff sticking back. So I'm gonna use that same ink pad. Hopefully it's not too disturbed from the potato. Add some ink, press it on my paper, and I didn't really apply even pressure, but there's my tree. And last but not least, I have a whole log here, and we're gonna make a print out of that. Yeah, you better believe me. So I I pulled out all the stops for this one. I actually have some pretty expensive ink over here, and then I have a, a fun rolling tool. So I've coated my roller with ink. I'm actually gonna rub this on the log. This is the one that took the most time. Um, I had to sand this log. I had to burn it with a torch, and then I had to blow some pressurized air on it to get all the ash out and then I had to shellac it with this um, stain so that it didn't um, you know absorb the ink too much but that's us when that's all said and done you can get to the point of applying ink and I'm going to put my log on my desk and then I'm going to add the paper on top sometimes it's helpful if you have like a jar or something to apply even pressure all right and let's see I'm going to remove my paper and there's my tree print. So those are four um, different printmaking techniques. Um, I'm not sure if they would artistically be classified as such, but that's what I'm calling them. And if you have a potato in your fridge, you can become an artist tonight. And that's my, that's my spiel. I think we need to get one of those on a red bubble t-shirt for everybody to uh, enjoy. Probably your, your log, you put a lot of effort into that. Um, but now, all right, let me see if I can do this. If you're not interested in making art and you'd prefer to not add beauty to society, but take some away, then you can learn how to lie with our next presenter, Trevor. Yeah. 
uh, that's so mean. Lies are beautiful. Or they can be. There's beauty in lying. It, it, it can be an art form. And we're going to learn about how. Uh, once I figure out how to share my screen, because I'm used to doing all this with uh, two monitors, which I don't have right now. OK. <clears throat> All right, and hopefully everyone can still see this. Um, all right, so we're going to be talking about uh, lying today. Um, so uh, when I talk about something, for instance, if I'm going to be talking about a bird and I say the word bird, you kind of have a mental image of what I'm going to be talking about or the kind of thing I have in mind when I say a bird. So you're going to be picturing something with wings and feathers. It's probably going to be kind of small. They lay eggs, they can fly, and they skip leg day because they have these twiggy little tiny legs. Um, so examples of these kinds of birds that you think of pretty automatically are things like blue jays or ravens. Um, and you know that these are kinds of birds. Um, there are some other kinds of birds that don't exactly meet these criteria, but you still identify them as birds. So an example of birds that don't have all of these properties are things like ostriches, which are too big, so they don't really meet the small criteria and they run, they don't fly. And uh, this ostrich clearly here does not skip leg day. It's got very beefy legs and I'm kind of jealous of. Um, and then on the other hand, we have something like a penguin, which is kind of fat and a little too tall to be your typical small sort of bird. They swim and they don't fly. And uh, this penguin here very clearly does not have any legs. So uh, Forrest Gump would be very supportive. Um, <clears throat> so those are uh, some kinds of birds. And so if I tell you to name a bird, you're usually most likely going to pick a kind of bird that has the greatest number of the features that you normally think of when you hear the word bird. And so that kind of points to the idea that you have a mental construct in, uh, in your head of what makes a bird so birdy. And those things all sort of culminate into what's called maybe a prototypical bird. And so the notion of prototypes is very important. Um, and so prototypes can be applied to a lot of things and they don't all have to be physical things like birds. Uh, they can also be abstract concepts, um, things like vacation or murder, which I have illustrated here with a nice little gif of Tom and Jerry um, and their special guest Spike all beating each other with household items. Uh, so we could ask, is this a prototypical murder? Yes or no, who knows? Um, but they can also be applied to things like lies. And so when we think about lying, we can ask, what does it mean to tell a lie? And what sort of characteristics does a lie have? And when we look at these kinds of things in uh, comparison to prototypes, this is a sort of specific field of what's called semantics. Um, and so when we look at what a lie means, or what things need to be true for something to be a lie. Um, one important part that we can usually think of pretty easily is that whatever information is being conveyed needs to be untrue. And on top of that, it's pretty important for the speaker to believe or know, or in some way be aware that the information that's being conveyed is false or that the speaker needs to believe that it is. Um, so that's something that we might consider important about lying. Um, the next thing is maybe that you're intending to deceive whoever you're speaking to. So if we consider these kind of the important features of a lie, we might ask, are some of them more important than others? And what does a prototypical lie look like versus a non-prototypical lie? <laughs> okay, so we start with our prototypical lie. Um, we might have a situation like the following, um, where I don't have any money, but I want candy. And so I decide to steal a candy bar from a store. And when I get home, my mom asks where I got the candy and I tell her I bought it so that I don't get in trouble. Um, so now I'm going to ask people to type in the chat how they would rate the scale on one to five, um, where one is honest aid and five is pants on fire. I say in this situation, did I lie to mama? And I'm seeing lots of fives in the chat. I would agree because this is a pretty clear cut case. I have all of the features of a lie here. Um, and so this is pretty cut and dry. I lied to mom, right? Um, but we can look at other kinds of lies and see if we take away some of those features, do we still consider these lies? Or to what degree we consider them to be a lie? 
So in the next scenario, I'm about to leave home to go to a bar I haven't visited in many years. And my Mormon roommate, who doesn't approve of drinking, asks where I'm going. To avoid a lecture when I get home, I say I'm going to IHOP. And when I arrive at my destination, I discover that the bar was torn down and replaced with an IHOP. Um, so now in the chat, go ahead and post, did I lie to my roommate? One to five. Uh, while you are doing that, um, you can see that the information I gave my roommate is untrue, but I believed uh, the, the information I gave was true, but I believed that the information was untrue. I didn't happen to know I was going to an IHOP, but I said I was um, because I was trying to trick my roommates. So I still intended to deceive them. And I believed I was saying something false, but I was actually saying something true. So is this a lie? Uh, people think, uh, still think so quite a bit. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So now another instance, I could say, uh, I'm going to a party at Alex's house on a school night and my mom asks where I'm going. And since I'm going to pass by a movie theater on my way to Alex's house, I say, I'm going by the movie theater. But on my way to the party, uh, there's a road closure and I have to take an alternate route that doesn't pass the movie theater on my way to Alex's house. So from one to five, did I lie to my mom? Uh, and while people are putting those, um, right, the information I gave my mom was untrue, but I thought I was telling my mom something true because I was going to pass a movie theater, and so I technically said I am going to go by the movie theater. That would have been true if I had, if things had gone according to plan. Unfortunately, there was a road closure I didn't know about, and so I ended up not going by the movie theater, but I was still planning to deceive my mother, um, so... These were lower. That looks like it probably averages about a three. Okay. So this is less of a lie than our big prototypical lie or uh, where I accidentally went to IHOP. Okay. So now if we have another scenario, uh, my coworker hosted a catastrophically bad dinner party at their house. And as I leave, uh, I can see that they're not happy about how the party went and they feel bad that everyone had a terrible night. I say, this was fun. We should do this more often. I don't expect them to believe me, but I want to be polite and encouraging to the host. So did I lie to the host? One to five. <clears throat> okay, and people are giving this a lot lower scores, right? So here I'm saying something that's not true, right? I didn't have fun. It was a terrible party. And uh, I, I am painfully aware that the party was terrible. Uh, and I'm not even trying to convince the host that I had a good time that we should do this more often because the party was terrible. Um, so there's no intent to deceive there. Um, and this looks to have gotten the lowest rating. So when we look at what's the most important part of a lie based on the ratings you gave, right? If we have all of these, it's pretty clear strong five. That's obviously a lie. If the information is untrue, but I believed it was, um, if the information ends up being true, but I believed it was false and I was trying to deceive somebody, uh, that still got pretty high ratings, fours and fives for most people. So that averaged about a four. Um, if I believed the information was true, and so basically I intended to deceive somebody and I said something that I thought was true and I just ended up being wrong, that's still pretty clearly a lie. And if I'm not trying to deceive anybody, uh, people gave that the lowest rating, I think it's probably averaging around a two. So it looks like as decided by this group, uh, the most important part about a lie is that you intend to deceive somebody, whether or not you just got something wrong or you accidentally told the truth, um, but still intending to be deceitful. Uh, the most important part of a lie is actually trying to fool somebody. So um, <clears throat> that's sort of the notion of prototypes and what it means to uh, lie. So uh, thanks everybody to Tim Roth. Uh, and that's all I have. Thank you, Trevor, for teaching us how to uh, go to IHOP more effectively. Uh, for our next presentation, I'd like to start with a question. Annie. Is Guam art or a lie? That's a very interesting question. Um, either. I sure hope you can answer that and more in your presentation, Introduction to Guam. Can you see my screen? Okay. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about Guam. Uh, it's where I was born and raised and where I'm currently based right now. Um, 
As one way to give you an example of how we're very different, we are the farthest U.S. territory. America has five. Um, and time zone wise, it is Thursday, 12.47 p.m. So we are very far ahead of everyone in the States. Um, but the first question that people usually ask is where exactly is Guam? And quite honestly, I can't even really tell you. I just usually say it's like a dot in the Pacific Ocean. Um, but we are extremely close to the Philippines near Japan and traditionally known for our strategic location um, because we are within target range of most of Asia, um, or at least most of East Asia, um, and kind of close to Australia. I mean, much closer, obviously, than the States, but we are about eight hours away from Australia, um, a couple of hours away from China, Korea, and Japan. Um, so there are a couple of ways to get to Guam. You can go by plane, by another plane, or by another plane. The joke on, uh, running joke on Guam is that we have what we call island fever. And so we really don't get to leave the island um, other by flying away from the island or going into the ocean, um, which for most people who don't know is within walking distance, basically 10 minutes, every place on Guam. Um, it's one of the few things that people do on Guam almost consistently. You can go daily, you can go weekly. Uh, growing up, whenever we had cleanups and field trips, it was always to the beach. Um, fiestas, parties, everything's done on the beach. And there are two main routes. Um, you go through Narita, Japan, or you go through Hawaii. Um, and they're usually very long stretches. So typical stretch from Newark is like 19, 20 hours, um, partly because there are a lot of long flights and there are also many layovers in between. Um, but the running joke, again, then is that a lot of the times when you get to Narita or Hawaii, they're called high school reunions or like middle school reunions um, because chances are that if you're getting on a flight from Narita to Guam, you almost always know someone. And another thing we say on Guam is like everyone's related to each other or everyone knows each other. And I have not found that to be incorrect. I think in the States, it's very common that you find people that you know from Guam and you can identify exactly what school or what village or what location they're from, or even sometimes very creepily like where they live. Um, and so it's a very, very small, small place, but everyone um, is very family oriented and we kind of all know each other. Um, though there's like a hundred some thousand people. So it's like not exactly true, but true to a certain extent. Um, on the left are what most people think of when they think of Guam, the militaries, um, and then I am a civilian. My family is not a part of the military, um, and so we're called what we call, call locals. Um, but essentially, most people think of us as a military base. We do have two military bases in the north and in the south, one's Navy and one's Air Force. Uh, there's huge military presence, but it actually doesn't interact, interact with civilian life that much. Um, that said, like I think in general, there is a deep sense of dislike for the military in certain locations, especially among the local people, culture mores, um, because the militaries tend to build on each land or um, whenever there are new soldiers coming in, a lot of times like crime rates grow up, um, you know, imagine people who are on ships and don't really have much to do. So naturally, um, I think crime rates usually do go up. But um, that said, we have one of the highest um, military enlistment rates in the country. And it is extremely common for people not to go to college and to go to the military instead or to go to a military academy. Uh, that is a very mild common um, And then here on the left is what we call our downtown region. Um, Guam is really small, so we don't really divide places based on cities, but we, this place is called Tumon. Um, Guam is known for duty free shops. Um, most big brands, Louis Vuitton, Cartier, and everything, um, Balenciaga, like these are very, very common brands on Guam because people come to shop um, for duty free items. And it's this really one long stretch of land where like hotels, um, like 20 hotels in a row are next to each other. And kind of most activities on Guam are usually held in this location. Um, but it also looks very different from the rest of the island. Is, this is geared toward tourists. It's very well maintained. It's very clean. We are extremely nice here. Um, and unfortunately, during COVID, it's extremely empty, as you can see. And then on the right is a beach. Uh, we have one of 75 beaches. Uh, really, it's just one long beach around the island. But um, we do have a lot of beaches, and water here is extremely clean. Um, and so the photo isn't inaccurate. Like, water is usually pretty clear, depending on where you go. Um, and kind of final note, 
Um, I think a lot of people think of like the military when they think of Guam, but as a civilian, we think of what we call fiestas on the left. Guam has a huge um, gathering like culture, usually at the beach, but also people hold what they call village fiestas. Um, we're on the left sometimes um, because it's a very Catholic island. There are a lot of religious walks throughout the island um, during the holidays. And it's very common to go to the beach and see a party. And it's very also common people just invite you to a party. Um, but on the right, we have our staple food. It's called red rice. It's marinated rice. It's extremely popular. Um, red rice and barbecues. So you know you're on island. Um, we Everything we say is on island, off island. Um, but you know you're back on island you can taste very good red rice. And that is my lesson on Guam. Um, so I will now pop bring it to um, Olivia, who will be teaching um, something else not Guam related. Hello. OK. So I will be teaching something that is not Guam related, but you can use it on Guam. Um, let me just figure out how to share my screen real quick. Um, can everyone see my slide presentation? Yes, thank you. Um, so we're six days or six or five days into 2022. So um, it's never too late to start. Um, I'll be teaching about how to use the notion um, you could say it's an app or um, application um, for this year to organize and keep your workspace tidy. So Notion is an all-in-one workspace. You can create pages, calendars, shopping lists, um, music playlists for your work time, um, just calming music when you want to put um, a self-care routine into action. This can all be placed into one application, um, one application called Notion. And I'll be quickly going through some pros and cons of using Notion and showing you some sample templates that I was able to found, I find and my own example or a reference that I use. One is you can build a system through using Notion. For me personally, I find it really hard to find a routine and just sticking through it. I started with I'm using notebooks as planners, but then I got sick of just writing all the time and I wanted something faster and, oh, don't get me started with whiteout. Like if you use pen and you have to white out like a whole line of what you did wrong or cross it out, like personally that really bothered me. So I found Notion and just started sticking to it and building a system through it. Um, I was able to, not having to jump back and forth between Google Calendar, Google Sheets, um, but instead having all of that in one place. So personally, I found that really helpful. The second thing is it syncs across your devices. If you have Notion as an app on your desktop or as an app in your phone, you could automatically, it's like um, a Google account. You can open it in your phone and in your um, computer. And the benefits of this is there was a time where I was trying to edit on the computer and I had my iPad right next to me, whatever I typed in my computer, it automatically synced within like 10 seconds. So you could, if you refresh your page, you can see what you edited on your computer directly change on your second device. Um, the aesthetic and how you want to organize yourself in Notion is also really dependent on your preference. Um, I personally have shifted from going from an empty notebook to decorating a whole template for myself on a notebook and using the fancy highlighters, uh, just colorful highlighters and pens. And for an art student, I also like putting like stickers or pictures or printing out pictures. Um, using a ruler was like sort of measuring all of that. And for Notion, because it's all like, digital based. Um, you can decide if you want to go from a minimal design, choose your color theme, or go to a complete like fancy, like all the fonts that you choose are specific and how you want to organize your sidebars and everything. Um, 
Another pro for this is you can also share your notion with others to see how they build their daily habits or their routines online. Um, you can share with your collaborators and what you see on your screen is what they will see. So there are ways where you can hide what you don't want them to see, but um, without having to create like a whole new display, you can show them what you see. Um, some of the cons, I'd say there are a lot of hidden tools within each button. Like within the plus sign, there's a to-do list, a bullet list, there's all kinds of tools. So at first, if you don't really get it or you don't really have the patience to start by creating um, a page, you can create pages with their sub pages and tables and there's even coding involved. So personally, I'm not really strong at coding. So I use a cheat sheet by finding templates that already have those codes. And I would use those codes to create like my tables, for example, if you want to calculate your expenses and incomes and how much you spend per month, there are pre-made codes where they can calculate um, how much you spend each month. So um, there are many free templates available um, in the descriptions of YouTube tutorials. If you just look up how to use Notion on YouTube, there's a lot of tutorials and different aesthetic themes that you can um, refer to. And of course, if a template does not fit your aesthetic, it's actually adjustable. So it would automatically transfer that template. If you click on the template link, it would automatically transfer it to your Notion account. Um, the benefits of that is you can delete. The delete button is very important. And I um, use just previously because 2022 just started, I actually created my own Notion workspace off of another person's template. There was one time where I didn't use a template and I found it really long for me to actually adapt and create all the steps. So this year I decided to refer to someone's um, annual Notion workspace and see how they organize themselves. And I'll transfer to some examples that I was able to find. Is everyone able to see the first sample that I have? So this is the first template that I found. Um, as you can see, it's a purple color theme. Um, it could go from you choosing pictures. Um, it has like this Pinterest vibe, but not really where you can also have a very strong aesthetic. You can have um, animated icons. And then the benefits of it is everything is on like within pages. So you could click on it and then there could be another template where it's already created for you and you could update everything. Um, the two things that I put um, use Notion for are my to-do list and my calendars. For to-do list, I find it very helpful if it's always like around you and you have it. So when I use planners, I don't always carry my planner around with me in my bag. So what I do is I have Notion on my phone and I would type all my to-do lists on my computer. But then when I leave home or when I want to go to school, I don't open my computer, but I just use my phone as the to-do list to check off everything. Um, to-do list, for example, today. Um, yep, so this is so this is the template. And if you can see up here, there is the open notion. So this template would automatically sync and all the formulas within it would sync to the notion. It's a bit of a technical difficulty. And then the second thing is as I can say, you can control your aesthetic and the colors. Here's a sage green template. And then here's a more neutral colors. 
um, depending on what you like, what makes, what colors calm you um, for that day. So here's an, um, my, the dashboard and the template that I used for 2022. The list that I chose was shopping list um, and budget tracker. So I was able to copy this onto my own page. And for example, here, I'm not in school yet, but when I do go to school, I'll be using this to keep myself organized and tidy. So I have like the stores that I wanna go to and maybe the shopping list or what I wanna buy with. Um, so within each of these tabs, there's more templates. And yeah, if you wanna organize yourself in 2022, you can, and you're too lazy to create a template yourself, you can always use the templates you find on YouTube and just adjust from there and give it a try. Thank you everyone.